So in this video I want to very briefly introduce dehydration to you and also how your body responds in order cons to conserve water. So in preparation for this video, if you haven't already, I suggest you watch some of the renal system videos, specifically the renin angiotensin aldosterone system videos and also the fluids and electrolytes video. Now, I want you to think about your body when it's at rest and you are sufficiently hydrated. Now that means that you have a sufficient amount of fluid in your body and we spoke about in the previous video that the fluid is compartmentalized into extracellular and intracellular fluid and that there's a particular concentration of this fluid and that concentration is determined by how many solutes are dissolved inside of that fluid. So I like to think of it as I've got a container with a certain amount of stuff dissolved inside of it. So you could think of this stuff as being sugar or salt or something like that. That's very similar inside of our body. We have a certain concentration of sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, hydrogen ions, uh, glucose, urea and so forth. Okay. Now this concentration is measured in milliosmoles. So the concentration of your body fluids should be between 290 and 300 milliosmoles. Okay, that's the normal concentration. And that again has to do with a balance between solutes and water. So the fluid balance. Now, think about what happens when you are no longer well hydrated. So you haven't had a drink of water for maybe 12 to 16 hours and you've been doing vigorous exercise. Well, that water that's inside of your body is either perspired or is breathed out or is burnt up through the activity of creating energy but overall it's utilized and disappears. Now the solutes in your body may be diminished slightly but not as much as the water in your body is which means that you have a particular concentration of solutes and water but when you start to do vigorous exercise and don't remain well hydrated, the water drops far below that of the solutes. And this is what I'm highlighting here. So going from a hydrated state where we have, just as an example, 10 solutes dissolved in one liter, okay? We move down to where we've become dehydrated. Well, what's happened is that the volume of the fluid is diminished, yet we still have those 10 solutes. So what happens then? Well, this fluid becomes more concentrated and that's what happens to our body fluids. It becomes more concentrated, which means that 290 to 300 milliosmoles may get a little bit higher and go to 320 milliosmoles. Now remember, this is kicking out of homeostasis. Homeostasis is between 290 to 300 milliosmoles, which means if it's being pushed out of homeostasis, our body must respond to try and bring it back. So I'm going to talk now about how our body responds. So first step is this. If we have a look at our brain, and that's a pretty dodgy looking brain, but you know I'm not the best drawer. All right, I won't draw the rest of the brain stem. So we have our cerebrum, and we, uh, and we have our cerebellum, and we have our medulla, uh, we have our midbrain, uh, pons and medulla, and then our spinal cord. Okay, well, there's a part of our brain, around about here, called the hypothalamus, okay? And the hypothalamus has two little danglies hanging below it. Okay, now these little danglies are the pituitary glands. And I've done a video on the pituitary glands and pituitary gland hormones. If you'd like to go back and watch that, please feel free. But what I'm going to do is now highlight that particular area. So we have the hypothalamus with the anterior and posterior pituitary. So let's write this down. Whoops. Hypothalamus. And this is the posterior pituitary gland and this is the anterior pituitary gland. Okay, why am I drawing this? Well, remember this concentrated fluid now is floating around your entire body, which means it even gets up to your brain and gets to the hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus has certain receptors and these receptors pick up an increase in osmolarity. So remember, measured in milliosmoles, which is a measurement of osmolarity, which is a measurement of concentration per volume. And this osmolarity is increased. And so 
The hypothalamus measures an increase, among other things, measures an increase in osmolarity. Now this increase in osmolarity is picked up by the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus sends a signal. Now, does it send it to the posterior or anterior pituitary? Well, it sends it to the posterior pituitary gland. And sending a signal to the posterior pituitary gland signals it to release one of two hormones. So remember, there's two hormones in the posterior pituitary. One is oxytocin, and the other is ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Well, today we're do dealing with hydration and water conservation, so it's going to be antidiuretic hormone. So, the posterior pituitary gland now releases antidiuretic hormone. Let's write that down. Antidiuretic hormone. So first, let's talk about what that is. Diuretic or diuresis means to expel, okay, to urinate. So antidiuresis is to not urinate. So this hormone plays a role when it's released to stop you from peeing, okay? So hopefully you've already drawn or connected the dots. You've gone, well, I'm dehydrated, so it wouldn't make sense for me to pee out more fluid. I need to conserve the fluid. That's exactly right. So this dehydrated state, which results in an increased osmolarity, is picked up by the hypothalamus, sends a signal to the posterior pituitary gland, which releases antidiuretic hormone into the bloodstream. Now, this antidiuretic hormone, which is now in the bloodstream, where does it go to? Well, it travels down until it gets to, where does blood always ultimately end up? At the kidneys, specifically at the filtration unit of the kidneys, which is the nephron. So, if I draw a nephron up, and you know from watching the previous videos on the nephrons, that you've got different components. So remember, this blood is ultimately going to make it down to the nephron. which means antidiuretics ultimately going to make it to the nephron, but where specifically does antidiuretic hormone act? So ADH is in here. Where does it act? Well, remember you have the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending loop of Henle, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, you have the distal convoluted tubule, and you have the collecting ducts. So where does ADH act? Well, ADH acts at the collecting ducts, which means ADH comes along and how does it function? Well, ADH inserts proteins into the walls of the collecting ducts. These proteins are called aquaporins. So what does aqua mean? Aqua means water. What does porin mean? It means hole. So it literally means water holes. ADH inserts water holes into the collecting ducts. And what do they do? Well, they tell water to jump back into the blood and into the body. Why is that important? Well, we're keeping our water. We're holding on to it. Because remember, if the water stayed in this collecting duct, it ultimately comes out as pee. So now ADH has told it to reabsorb. So how does our body, so this is just one way, but how does our body respond to dehydration? Well, when our blood and our interstitial fluid becomes dehydrated, it becomes more concentrated, which means its osmolarity has increased. This increased osmolarity stimulates the hypothalamus to tell the posterior pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone travels to the nephron, specifically the, dis, the, the collecting duct, it inserts aquaporin proteins, which tells the body to reabsorb water, and we keep a hold of that water, and this is our water conservation. So I hope that made sense.